Hello and welcome everybody to Brainwash Festival. I'm delighted to speak today to one of the most influential and driven forces in the world of international politics, Samantha Power. She started her career as a journalist covering the Bosnian War in the mid-90s um, and she wrote this Pulitzer, Pulitzer Prize winning book, uh, Problem from Hell, America in the Age of Genocide, about it. This book, um, it uh, caught the attention of then Senator Barack Obama, who hired her immediately as his advisor on foreign policy and human rights. She followed him to the White House and she became ultimately his ambassador to the United Nations. Currently, she is a professor of global leadership and public policy at Harvard Kennedy School and of the practice in human rights at Harvard Law School. I'm very pleased to welcome her today from Boston, Ambassador Samantha Power. Great to be here, Sophie. Thank you so much for having me. And Ama apologies for the slightly informal ambiance here in my car. Yes, I've just called you a driven force, but you seem to be a driving force now. What, what happened? I'm not driving as we speak, I promise. But in the era of Zoom, we have to kind of wing it. I had a bit of a childcare crisis this morning, and so I had to drive my son three hours. I'm actually in Connecticut in a parking lot with my son playing tennis. I can't go see his tournament anyway because of COVID. We're not allowed to have gatherings of over 50 people uh, unless you're the president of the United States and are allowed to host super spreader events. Uh, but uh, again, forgive, uh, we, we're, we're winging it one and all uh, in, this, in this wild era. And so it is, we're just improvising all of us. Don't, don't bother, we're very pleased that you're with us. Um, since you are on a journey, I think it, it's a nice moment to, to start, um, let's say, looking back at your career that has often been described as a journey, um, a journey basically uh, of arguing that something must be done to actually do it. With all the compromises that entailed, of course, um, you worked as a journalist, a diplomat, an academic, you were the US ambassador to the United Nations, as I just mentioned. I was curious, in what role so far have you had the feeling that you could best live up to your own set of ideals without compromising too much? Yeah, I mean, let me just say, I think the most rewarding in terms of being able to see impact, you know, something really tangible uh, was serving in President Obama's cabinet, particularly in his second term, uh, which I was privileged to do as ambassador. And that's something that the U.S. does, tends to do under Democratic administrations, making the U.N. ambassador a cabinet level post. But operating at that level when he himself was liberated and when some of the early investments he had made in the first term in restoring U.S. standing in the world, you know, relevant lessons potentially if we, if we see a, a Biden win about how you dig America out of the large holes <laughs> that in that instance were left by the invasion of Iraq and the introduction of torture and Guantanamo and all of that. So the first term was a lot of brush clearing and relationship building, a return to the United Nations institutions that the George W. Bush administration had fled. But by the second term, you know, we were ready to really um, take advantage of the fact that American capital, uh, you know, had been, if not fully restored, uh, at least you know, substantially increased. And so the events that I got to be a part of were negotiating the Paris Agreement, which of course we know is not at all sufficient. You, especially in your country, know that uh, given rising waters and so forth, we know it here. Uh, half of us know it at least. Uh, we're very divided, of course, on climate science. But just to get the United States and China uh, agreeing, you know, that developed and developing nations have responsibilities. There had been a big division in the international system where countries like China and India stayed on one side of the room and said, look, you, you know, you all are the major polluters. We're just getting going and lifting people out of poverty. Who are you to tell us to stop building coal plants? And we got past that in Paris and laid a foundation to do something more. And when you think of the number one issue, sort of when I think about my son, and his future and and his futures. I mean, climate is is number one. And I, I just wouldn't have had the chance to experience anything like that from outside. Is it a compromise entailed? For sure. It's a large multinational sprawling negotiation. And again, it was just a floor from which we knew we needed to quickly uh, build and, and do something even more ambitious. And sadly, we, we in the United States at least have lost four years uh, on that quest. 
but also in the age of COVID, you know, to look back and think about the good that we were able to do together, including with your government, uh, but to end the Ebola epidemic, which now seems like it was so obvious that the world would come together uh, to eradicate that epidemic before it became a pandemic, but it was not at all obvious at the time. And to be the person at the UN, you know, helping President Obama pull that coalition together, actually going to China and saying, hey, this is the number of labs we're building. This is the number of Ebola treatment units we're building in Liberia. What are you willing to do in Sierra Leone? Or what might you be able to supplement in Liberia and so forth? And to do that with Cuba, with whom we didn't even have proper diplomatic relations at that time, but to say behind the scenes, so no uh, politicians in America who would exploit it could see us, uh, how many doctors can you send, You know, given that you have this uh, renowned health core that's been active in sub-Saharan Africa for many, many years. So just these examples, and there are many others like it that I, that I write about in the education of an idealist, because there's so much despair about whether you can do good in the world, uh, whether government is all about selling out, or whether you can you know, feel as if you're moving things forward. And for all of the frustrations, and of course, we can, I'm sure we'll talk about episodes that I felt like I was banging my head against the wall, but by and large, particularly working for a president whose values I shared, who whatever disagreement we had, I felt he always welcomed dissent, you know, unlike very much the current president who, you know, fires people or excludes them from meetings or ridicules them on Twitter if they if they disagree with him. You know, I had a president where even where we were, uh, you know, uh, arguing even quite uh, vociferously at times, he would always want me back. You know, he always sort of knew that he would end up in what he thought was a better place, all things considered, if he had those voices that did not just simply praise him and tell him how wonderful uh, his decision making was. So government, I put atop the list. And then in terms of real impact, I guess being a mom also, which was something that came to me late in life. I married in my late 30s and was lucky to sneak in uh, two children. I write in the book also about my IVF struggles and uh, that so many women I know can relate to. And but, you know, that figuring out how to get the balance right, you know, now as a not as an activist or as a journalist, but just as a as a working mother. Uh, and th this again, <laughs> the car setting for our talk is an example of how inelegant uh, it sometimes seems. But but I've been just lucky to be able to experiment as you have. I mean, from your bio, you know, being able to to also see what it's like on the inside. So when you go back to the outside, you have some understanding and can make, uh, you know, in your case as a journalist, your questions more more piercing because you've 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 seen it a little bit from the inside. As an advocate to uh, to tailor your recommendations, you know, understanding what some of the constraints are that do exist. Um, and so I, I, you know, for anyone who can who can manage it to, to, to actually have the experience on, on both sides of, of uh, government, I think is, is, is very, very helpful in informing both perspectives. Being a journalist, I'm going to break in here. Um, you've already uh, um, mentioned your memoir, the, the book you wrote in 2019, it was published, titled The Education of an Idealist, where you describe the various roles that you have played in your life very elaborately, very open-heartedly. I would like to start um, at the starting point of your career being a journalist, as you, was in the, as you were in the 90s. Um, I was curious... Um, you went off to Bosnia in your 20s. You were very young at the time, if I may say so. What was the defining moment for you to quit reporting, to really go to the other side, um, where you felt, I have to get at the other side of the microphone and into the room where decisions are made? Well, my defining moment was actually a defining moment for your country in some respects as well, because it was, I was, I went for the first time in the summer of 1993 I saw UN peacekeepers, you know, from different countries struggling because they were, of course, sent to a place where there was no peace to keep. Um, you know, some of the Western European countries, the United Kingdom, France, of course, uh, the Netherlands, uh, the Danes, involved in peacekeeping in ways they are not today in 2020. Um, but, you know, I was, as a journalist, we were the sort of do something brigade, we were called, uh, you know, it was very hard to watch people herded up into rape camps or into concentration camps as had happened in the early years of the war. And, you know, um, 
and you know, feel like you were a witness to that and that your journalism wasn't convincing anybody to do anything about it. But I went, as you said, very young. Um, I think I was 22 when I got there the first time and then would end up being 20, just shy of 25 when I left. And the defining moment was describing those atrocities, feeling as if what we were writing was powerful in its way but not breaking through. And then in the summer of 1995, July, to be precise, as many in your audience will remember, by then I, w I had kind of made it at least as a stringer and I was finally writing for the Washington Post, which was my dream because I was, you know, again, with this kind of policy orientation, this wonky orientation that I had and this desire to see people be rescued, I was writing every day for President Clinton uh, because I knew the Washington Post would... Uh, you know, be there uh, at his at his doorstep, uh, as it were, in the White House uh, every morning. And I got reports, as we all did, that uh, Bosnian Serb uh, military forces were charging, storming the, the Srebrenica so-called safe area where Dutch peacekeepers were present. And uh, it became quite clear as the day progressed and into the night that the safe area was very, very vulnerable. And I called my editor at the Washington Post and I said, you know, this is a major story and a major news event, uh, this safe area, all of these safe areas have come under attack before, but it's about to be overrun. And if it is, you know, we don't know what the Dutch will do. We don't know what, above all, Ratko Mladic, the Bosnian Serb general in charge of uh, the Bosnian Serb military, what he's going to have done to the people that he apprehends. And my editor, and I remember it like it was yesterday, he said, well, Samantha, it sounds like when Srebrenica falls, we'll have a story. In other words, if it bleeds, it leads, right? But a preventive, you know, a, a kind of siren call, uh, you know, he it just by then in the war, there'd been so many sad stories told and so many Bosnian Serb attacks on this or that. And even, of course, infighting also between Croats and, and Bosniaks, Muslims. So I just stared at the phone and I was just like, seriously? And that seemed kind of bad that night. And I thought I wasn't very persuasive and I'm so inexperienced. And, you know, why was I unable to get him to to run the story, but then you can imagine the next day and in the ensuing week where Bosnian Serbs did take the safe ferry, where they pulled every Muslim man and boy off UN bases uh, and off buses and chased those who tried to flee you know, into the woods and killed everyone they could get their hands on. They murdered, they executed. So I carried around just a sense, I guess, a, you know, with a, it was a complex set of emotions. I mean, for starters, you know, feeling frustrated with journalism, I suppose, and with this thing that I was doing, which was describing symptoms in a way and not root causes and not and and in a way that was proving ineffectual, at least from the standpoint of influencing policy. Um, but I even thought, you know, had I written that story, would it have made any difference? And I, I think I think so. I was frustrated, yes, with my editor. I was frustrated with myself. I was, of course, heartbroken by what happened in and around the safe area itself. But I, but it was more just on journalism. I thought at the height of my career, I'll be right here, uh, you know, at, at one of the most important historical events in the in the course of this war and in the course of post World War II European history. And I'll still be having a fight with my editor and and hoping that someone in the White House reads my my article. So, you know, I wouldn't say that then I I said one day I'm going to be you know, U.S. ambassador to the U.N. or or in a car contributing to the Brainwash Festival. <laughs> you know, it was nothing so uh, willful. Right. And, and you, you know, it, it was more, I, I, need, I need more skills, I basically felt. I need, if I'm going to make a difference, if I'm going to be of any use to people who are so vulnerable and so voiceless, I've got to be doing more than I'm doing right now. And so I didn't know what form that would take. I, I thought maybe it would mean actually going to The Hague. Went to Den Haag and and being a prosecutor right there uh, at the International you, Criminal Court. It, at the inter well, then actually the the Tribunal for Yugoslavia, mm. you know, or or which was had already been set up. The ICC was just a gleam in someone's eye, I suppose, at that point. So this is back in 1995, so mm. 25 years ago. But it's what I sent me back to law school. I went to law school, and it was there that actually for a class I began working 
on this, what was a paper on American responses to the major genocides of the 20th century, where I sought to put Srebrenica in a larger context mm. to try to understand. Mm. Maybe what, you know, following up on that book that you've written about uh, the, the experience you had in, in Srebrenica, amongst others, A Problem from Hell, the Pulitzer Prize winning book, um, you describe why and how successive U.S. administrations since the Second World War had failed to respond effectively to genocide, despite all the vows of, of never again. Um, at the time, you were an academic uh, who had just returned from Yugoslavia when you wrote the book. Um, would you judge, I was wondering, that the, um, the operating of the U.S. government officials, politicians, differently now that you've worked as a politician yourself? Well, I've never worked as a politician. No, at well, least right, sorry, you worked as in, in the American system. sense of the word, at least. Yes, like, I don't know European in the Dutch sense. Things. Maybe, maybe anyone in government who's got a... Sorry, you know, as a government uh, official in politics, but no, still. No, 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 it's okay, it's okay. It's just that they are different, slightly different animals over here, although less so in the current administration. Um, I don't think so. You know, I've, 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 I teach still a little bit from that book. Um, I think the education of an idealist actually has more to teach about the contemporary world and particularly because it offers the vantage point from inside and outside. Um, but, you know, the, the book is very careful about talking about the importance of mass atrocities getting elevated within our respective governments and within international institutions. And, you know, when I went, I mean, again, it was so long ago, but when I went back and looked at the Holocaust and the Armenian genocide and the Rwanda genocide in 1994, you know, just so often the fate of people in the case of the Holocaust who were being exterminated, you know, or in the case of the Armenian genocide, similarly, it just didn't really get elevated in the U.S. government. It didn't even really make it to high level decision making. And and so that's that is very fixable. And, and that's what I learned in working for President Obama. You know, we may talk briefly uh, or at any length you want about Syria. And of course, the failure that I'm associated with of being able to rescue people from a slaughter, you know, that, that, that is ongoing really as we speak in, in certain communities. Um, but that wasn't because it didn't rise to the, the president's attention or that there was no, uh, you know, set of measures put in place. It was fundamentally that after the war in Iraq, the prospect of using military force in another mili Middle Eastern country seemed very unlikely to make the kind of difference that that we would have wished to make. And we had tried economic sanctions and tried diplomacy and tried other things. But as I write in, in my latest book, I mean, there were so many issues, the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda, the it's turned south, unfortunately, in South Sudan, but getting South Sudan to become an independent country after the horrible uh, mass atrocities committed by the government in Khartoum. You know, I could give you example after example. And so... I actually think, you know, being inside and showing how it, you just getting an issue quickly higher up in the system so you can cut through the red tape. It doesn't mean you, you make the world a kind and gentle place, but it does mean, I think, that you don't look back and say, oh, I, you know, there were all these relatively low risk things that we should have tried. And we didn't even try those, which is what we say about, for example, admitting Jewish refugees in the Holocaust or radio jamming during the Rwanda genocide. So, so it actually, I think, I, I, you know, I think being inside, I also see the role that individuals can make uh, in, in, in pushing these issues. And so I felt, of course, a, a grave responsibility to do that, having written this book and been so loudmouthed about it as an outsider. But it also made me feel personally responsible during Syria, because mm. yes, I was pushing, but it clearly mm. wasn't having the desired effect outside. And, and so I should feel responsible. In other words, to be true to the kind of spirit of, of that first book, I, I think officials have to be taken into account. And so when people call for my resignation, you know, when I was in the Obama administration, I had to think seriously about that. I mean, that was something that in my writing, I had encouraged other officials to consider if they felt as if we were looking away from mass atrocity. In Obama's case, I didn't feel he really was, honestly. I just felt as though, you know, given Russian opposition, Iranian support, and the Iraq war, it was a very messy, the prospect of, of you know, establishing a no-fly zone, et cetera, was just the risks of that seemed much more substantial than yeah. in some of the cases that I wrote about. But but I, I, I saw it, no, I, I actually, I know it sounds like a rationalization, but I, I would not write the book differently today, in part because, again, 
it stresses the importance of the toolbox, mm. that there's a range of tools. It's not some kind of knee jerk, you know, we should, you know, America needs to be going, be the world's policeman or this or that. I mean, that would be crazy. I, w- I thought it was crazy when I was an activist and I would think it's, you know, equally crazy now. Mm. But still, I mean, you, you decided to stay. You didn't resign uh, to, uh, to in, uh, in the case of Obama's refusal to intervene in the Syrian war. Um, you ask yourself in the book whether you've become, and let me get this right, what Obama's human rights critics said he had become, namely just another realist, but one who feels bad about it. Um, looking back, how would you characterize yourself in your role in the White House? Um, well, in, so I was in the White House for the first four years and then UN ambassador for the last four. Yeah, but coming back to this quote of were you a realist, you know, feeling bad about it um, in this particular case or were you an idealist mm-hmm. still? Well, I don't think there, I don't think anybody who's realistic about the world, I mean, this is just my view, but I, 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 I think... Um, you have to be idealistic, uh, you know, looking at the current world or looking at the world that we were looking at back then. And, and maybe just for definitional sake, by idealistic, did that mean, did I think that human rights and human consequences should be integrated into U.S. decision making more than they often are? Yes. <laughs> did that mean that we shouldn't have sent, you know, uh, you know, uh, open-ended support for the Saudi effort in Yemen? Yes, we should not have, right? And and that started under the Obama administration. And that's the voice that I needed to raise within within the government. Is that, you know, should we be trying to get political prisoners out of jail around the world using US leverage to do that so that those voices can be heard in their own communities? Yes. Uh, should we be again trying to break through Chinese resistance on climate change? Yes. That that doing that, even the Paris Agreement is a is an execution of idealism because it's a dissatisfaction with the world as it is, and a belief that we have to do better uh, for, for the present and, and for the future. So I never, ch- I, I mean, you know, publicly, sometimes I'd be in a position where I'd have to defend a policy that I had disagreed with privately. And so that's the kind of compromise that you alluded to earlier. And so you could say, I suppose that, you know, I don't know what, I think critics would say I shouldn't have done that, but you can't, it's not like I got to have my own foreign policy. If I, if Obama disagreed with me and he decided something, I couldn't go out and, you know, go to the mic at the, at the UN and say, well, my view is Obama, you know, he's decided to go in this direction, but here's the argument. I'm, you know, fundamentally you're part of a team, but if on balance I was losing more than I was, I felt like I was being heard if I felt like he had become cynical about what U.S. foreign policy should be, you know, then I really do think it would have been time to to do something else or to try to influence or criticize from the outside. But, you know, I don't see, again, if, if, if the definition of idealism is that you are looking around the world and you're not liking what you're seeing and you're, you're measuring what you're seeing against a set of standards, call them ideals, and that you yourself are seeking to do something to try to bridge that gap between the world as it is and the world that we need, that's idealism, right? And, and you know, they, they say idealists are people in, in this country, in America these days, an idealist is someone who believes you should work through the World Health Organization to deal with a global pandemic. What? How is that idealism, right? That's realism. It's a global pandemic for crying out loud. So I just, these terms I feel end up sometimes obscuring, you know, more than they clarify, but I do believe that stability in the world is, and so that kind of core interests of security and stability and even prosperity, the sort of core traditional realist objectives, that those are advanced as human rights uh, enjoyment expands. Hmm. And we see how much less stable a world is where a, a leader gets to gas his people or, you know, where doors are slammed on refugees and they get radicalized, uh, you know, by terrorist recruiters or prison repression in Egypt, which gave rise to Al Qaeda. You know, the idea that human rights and security are separable is just very, uh, I think, old fashioned and no longer well placed for, for the world that we're in. Mm-hmm. Um Maybe before we zoom in a bit more on the current U.S. political situation, um, I would like to come back to this this role of, of diplomat that you've played for a very long time. You state in the book, diplomacy is mainly about putting yourself in, in the shoes of others, if I paraphrase. I was curious, with, who, with whom was it most difficult to do so? 
Well, not the Dutch ambassadors. Very easy to put myself in his very large, large shoes. Uh, Carol Van Ostrom, who also has a book out, I think, in Dutch, and organized some of the best football games, um, but also was terrific on Yemen in, in pushing at the Human Rights Council, working with his Dutch counterparts, um, frankly, to hold uh, not only Saudi Arabia uh, to account, but also uh, supporters like, like the U.S. And, and so Carol is now a Dutch ambassador to the United Kingdom, uh, but it was a really fruitful partnership that I, that I had with him. He was one of the first people who came to me when we were thinking, Obama was thinking about striking Assad uh, in 2013, after 1,400 people were gassed to death, and Carol was one of the first people, you know, acting, uh, I hope and I'm sure, with, with the Dutch government support, but who came to <laughs> brainstorm about whether we could use mm. this horrible attack to get all of Syria, Syria's chemical weapons out and to launch a destruction mission and a dismantlement mission. And so that ended up being, of course, the, the path that we took, rightly or wrongly. There's a lot of controversy around that path, but it did mean that when ISIS grew up in Syria, that those uh, the large stockpiles of chemical weapons were no longer there, um, thanks to OPCW and this UN mission. But um, I asked ask for the difficult about, ones. I say, asked say for the again? difficult ones. Repeat. I'm sorry, sorry, I Sophie. asked for the difficult ones. Uh, no, no, which, exactly. Sorry, I was coming. I was coming there, but I, you know, uh, it's a dark world out there. Like, let's let's uh, and and we might as well celebrate U.S. Dutch cooperation while we Fantastic. still had it back then. Remember, remember the good old days. So let's let's cheer for that. Um, no, I, I'd say, look, I and I write about this in the Education of an Idealist. It was very challenging to maintain. A, a quite a deep relationship that I built with the Russian ambassador at the time where Russia was, you know, uh, lopping off part of Ukraine, you know, trying to annex Crimea after, and I, I don't have to tell Dutch viewers this, but after the MH17 uh, shoot down and the denialism, I mean, again, you know, the, the relationship that I built with the Russian ambassador was, was one where I knew that the, the, the man that I knew, and, and again, I'm sure my Dutch counterparts would agree, but was a decent, you know, a decent guy who loved his family, you know, cared about events in the world, wanted to co find ways to cooperate where he could. And then, but working for Putin, when that plane got shot down, you know, the nonsense, the fiction, the, the, the obfuscation, I mean, it was, it was, it was crushing to see so, you know, individuals who knew better representing the Russian Federation towing this line. Again, just like I described earlier that I had to, I understood why he had to do it, but you can imagine that didn't do wonders for my ability to mm. empathize. And mm. then when Russia got involved in bombing Aleppo and again, denying that it was involved until, you know, uh, Russian planes were, were photographed and, and Russian officers were bragging about it on the ground, so this relationship got more and more strained over the life of my time at the UN, culminating, of course, in Russia's interference in the U.S. 2016 election mm. uh, in ways that, given that the election was settled by 78,000 votes, may well have proven pivotal, along with other factors, of course. So <laughs> that was really tricky. I mean, and given what Trump has wrought, uh, in retrospect, even trickier, but we still tried, he and I both, because it was it was hard for him politically within his own system to be co seen to be negotiating, you know, privately with me. We would, you know, send our respective teams away and see if we could just kind of creatively work together to find common ground, whether on a peacekeeping mission or on Syria or on a whole host of other uh, issues that we continue to try to compartmentalize so I did put myself in his shoes and think, what would it be like to work for Putin? But of course, then I very quickly got to the point of saying, you know, I wouldn't work for Putin. I mean, Putin's not Obama and uh, but far from it. So so it was very tricky. Uh, his name is Vitaly Cherkin. And um, I do know that almost nothing that I was able to get through the Security Council while I was ambassador would I have been able to get through if he didn't also try to put himself in my shoes. Mm. And so it was very sad at the end of my time that it was just getting harder and harder. And, and very sadly, he passed away in the first year of the Trump administration. And since then, you've seen 
you know, none of the, the agreements that we did to get, you know, humanitarian assistance into northern Syria, to get an investigative mechanism uh, into chemical weapons attacks, those things that we manage, we used to call it pulling water from a stone, you know, none of those things have been carried forward in the same way. And I, I, I do think it's when when you can no longer see each other as situated selves, you know, as people mm. who, as individuals who have politics, who have bosses, who have lives outside of their jobs, I think that's when cooperation really breaks down. And sadly, I think that's where we are today. Mm. Let's let's move on to today. Um, I found this quote in your book uh, on topic of, of how idealistic can one be, a friend of yours who told you, pick your battles and go win some. Um, how do you apply that lesson to, to present day America, if you will? Which battles do you pick now? Well, you know, I, I don't know any national security professionals or foreign policy professionals who haven't, at least to some extent, pivoted to a near constant focus on domestic politics. Hmm. And so, and I'm sure that's what your viewers are interested in. I'm happy to talk about domestic politics. Sophie, if you'd, if you'd talked to me four years ago, well, I would have been in my job. I wouldn't have been able to talk to you about American politics, but I wouldn't have had anything to say. You know, I was a, I was a foreign policy person. I was a diplomat. Of course, I was a citizen. But, you know, given the extent to which foreign policy, international affairs, you know, our alliances, including our friendship, uh, with the Netherlands, but our, you know the entire transatlantic relationship, uh, all are imperiled uh, by um, the election outcome from 2016. And not only that, but also the fact that uh, the U.S. Senate has been in Republican hands uh, for these last four years, and that people who know better, uh, Republicans who know better, who who I worked with very productively on on certain issues, um, more at the beginning of Obama's eight years than toward the end when it was getting very uh, difficult to work with them as the party began to change. But but those Republicans have gone along with things that I know many of them uh, disagree with, um, and they've done so because they see that that's the way the wind is blowing. They're afraid of Donald Trump coming after them as he does. He creates a real cost to people within his own party who turn on, you know, I put in quotes, turn on him from, from his, his standpoint. Um, but the U.S. Senate is absolutely critical. Look at the Supreme Court justice who will go through and, and who could be in a position to make really key decisions as they relate to this election. Hmm. Uh, I mean, this is how chilling uh, the turn of events are. And as the rule of law in America gets more and more battered by not only Trump, who's Trump, He's going to be Trump forevermore. <laughs> There's no surprises that we're ever going to get from Trump. Um, every time people think, oh, now he has COVID, you know, maybe he'll be chastened by that and he'll come out and he'll show more empathy and or he'll respect science. No, nope. <laughs> same Trump, uh, just just a week or two later, um, maybe a few pounds lighter, but same Trump. Um, so it's really those other institutions that we needed to look to uh, to stand for the rule of law. And. The U.S. Senate is one example. Uh, the courts is, is another. Uh, Republican or right wing media, you know, has really enabled and abetted and even radicalized uh, the, the Trump base further. So, you know, I think when you ask what I'm working on, I'm working on getting Joe Biden elected. I'm focused on not just the Senate, which is so critical if Joe Biden becomes president uh, to ensuring that he can push an aggressive climate agenda through or mm even just meaningful stimulus for people affected by COVID. Uh, but but honestly, Sophie, I'm, I'm focused on state house races, which is a little obscure maybe for Sorry, your audience. Sorry, yeah, what's but, that? You know, the, the Texas state legislature, mm. you know, which mm. only requires a few states to, to flip. And if those flip, then these horrible election maps that have become, you know, kind of the norm in America where politicians get to choose their voters, <laughs> rather than voters choosing their politicians because the politicians who get elected get to write the maps. So they get to decide kind of how to, how to define the districts. And then that's, it's the district that then will choose them. So you put just a sprinkling of Democrats and make sure that it's deep red Republican. And so that you'll just get elected and elected and elected. And if a district is not a little bit red and a little bit blue, there's no incentive to compromise in Washington because 
it's inherently, uh, you know, uh, a, a district that, that is only going to go in one direction that doesn't feel the need uh, to cross the aisle. And that's one reason that we have such extremism and such polarization in this country. So I'm just doing fundraisers, phone banking. You know, I'm a citizen, uh, so I don't have any special leverage in this time. Uh, foreign policy has not been a big issue in the election, uh, a little bit on climate and a little bit, of course, on how the pandemic uh, the international dimension of the pandemic and a fair amount about China, but everything else is about healthcare, the economy, um, you know, and and the fate of our democracy. And I just, I, you know, we're only a couple of weeks out now, two weeks and and two or three days from from when the 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 votes will the, the last votes will will be entered into the system on November third, and then you know I'm not sure when we'll find out, but there's much more to look to in this election than what happens between Donald Trump and, and Joe Biden. Mm. You know, across America, there there is, as Biden says, a battle for the soul of the nation. It's being played out in every theater. But would, would you say things have been irrevocably changed over the last years? I mean, and, and maybe zip that in a uh, second question, and can the U.S. recover its global leadership if the country seems so internally divided? And should it? Well, I think you put your finger on the most worrying dimension of the status quo. You know, a Trump... You know, he can come and he he can hopefully go. Uh, but Trumpism, you know, this this sector of society that rejects immigration, that even stripped from, you know, one of the U.S. government buildings, the, the, the mantra that the U.S. is a nation of immigrants. They're trying to even rewrite what we are, even though we are, of course, what we are, uh, including, of course, foundationally a nation of Dutch immigrants. So, um, you know, it is... Um, it is worrying, but the, more worrying even than the enabling by Republicans who know better is the media ecosystem that has allowed conspiracy theories to become more, not less prominent and more, not less heated. That, that, and, and that, you know, whether it's in social media or even in, in more traditional media like Fox News The fact that we have so many venues in which lies are propagated and which, you know, even innocent listeners, you know, just if you if you or I were fed a diet of those lies and that fear mongering, we, too, might be drawn, you know, to some of these more extreme messages from from Trump. Um, if you believed every refugee was a terrorist, if you believe every Mexican was the reason that you'd lost your job at the coal plant rather than the fact that the world economy has moved on beyond coal, you know, but that's what they're telling you. And so they're creating enemies and they're pitting us against one another. So that is the biggest hurdle to your, both of your questions to the recovery. But let's, I think there's a big backlash going on right now about Chinese leadership in the world. Uh, I don't think people like the aggressive turn that President Xi has taken, even if many European countries, of course, are hedging and they're not, you know, turning their back on China or denouncing China. They're they're waiting to see what happens in the U.S. election. The, the, the fact of the matter is, you know, the international system needs the United States to be a constructive player. Think of vaccine distribution in developing countries. It is wonderful that European countries like President, President Macron and Chancellor Merkel and Prime Minister Trudeau from Canada, that they are trying to lead, uh, you know, vocally along with Bill Gates, an American at least, uh, to try to get, you know, vaccines not only to their own people, but but uh, distributed ultimately uh, to poor countries that wouldn't be able to afford those vaccines. But think of the difference it would make for the United States to show up again at the table, as we did on Ebola. Uh, as we did in, in for, you know, pulling together the coalition to fight ISIS. Um, America is needed and America can, even with our divisions, if especially Biden can win and there is what Mitch McConnell and others have referred to as potentially a blue tsunami. I, I, I'm skeptical because I'm worried about fraud and, and voter suppression and so forth. So I'm very nervous about the election. But let's say some of these polls were borne out That would, uh, if the margin is significant enough, that would be a repudiation not only of the man, Donald Trump, but also, uh, at least for a very significant core of the country, a repudiation of the ideology that he has propagated and the hate and the fear. And it would be an embrace uh, of a person who wants to tell the truth, who wants to return ethics and the rule of law and wants to return to, to 
credible U.S. leadership in the world. But I will tell you, Sophie, if Biden wins, it's going to be a very humble America that engages our, our European friends, knowing what we've put you through in terms of the treatment of the alliance, but knowing also that you see uh, uh, you see inside America. You see hmm. the issues that we have uh, but, that are that are very damaging to our to our ability to lead, irrespective of who the president is. Hmm. But but what then would be your advice to your European friends, as you call them, given this new American stance uh, on global issues, whoever the well, president I, will be? Yeah, I have no no problem giving that advice. Democracies need to stand together. Um, You know, China is seeking to, and I should say, virtually all of the most significant things I was able to achieve as UN ambassador working for President Obama, I achieved because of my ability, not just my ability, but the America's ability to work closely with China. So Paris Agreement, the Ebola effort, I, I, I offered those two examples, but the Iran nuclear deal, I, I could go on and on. So we have to work with China. But we also, as democracies, have to be clear-eyed about the extent to which China wants to chip away at inter not just human. I mean, we know what China's doing domestically in terms of human rights, but they don't like the human rights rules that have defined the international order since 1945. Now, the United States has not lived by those rules. Uh, all of us have been imperfect, some countries more imperfect than others. Um, and even to talk about perfection seems crazy in the context of human rights and, and humanitarian law. But we, we believe that those principles are good for us all, right? Because they are what are used to hold us accountable to a set of standards that go beyond any one country's laws or any one country's arbitrary decision about how it wants to, to treat its people. And if China, through its leverage at the UN and with democracies kind of divided and fragmented, If China keeps going in the way that President Xi seems intent on doing, we could lose those standards and we could enter a world where there are two internets. I mean, we're already kind of heading in that direction or where China seeks to actually cripple freedom of speech uh, in the worldwide internet and, and takes advantage of America's absence and Europe's ambivalence uh, to, to change those rules as well. So, so we really have an interest in Collaborating with China where it's appropriate for all of our shared interests and certainly on behalf of global in response to global threats. But we have to stand together as democracies to defend values that are stabilizing. They are not nice to have values. They are need to have values uh, in the 21st century. To, to, to respond to a pandemic properly, if anybody thinks that a culture of fear uh, lends itself to a crisp and uh, prompt response to the next pandemic, they didn't study what happened in Wuhan carefully enough. Hmm. Now, at the same time, you, you, if anybody thinks a polarized country is going to respond uh, well, or a, a country where misinformation is allowed to run rampant on the internet is going to respond well, they haven't studied the American response, right? There's plenty to learn out of this. But that's my advice for Europe is that We've all learned a lot about what America, about America's vulnerabilities and the fragility of America's democracy and the fragility of America's leadership in the world. That we can't get away from what just happened, and we can't get away from the fact that if Trump was elected once, our European partners are going to think, well, that could happen again. That is going to be in the heads of our European interlocutors going forward. Hmm. But at the same time, there's nobody here but us chickens, right? There's nobody here. There's nothing here but the present. We have to find a way to work together. Uh, and that's going to require taking a leap of faith um, and, and uh, you know, restoring these alliances and recognizing that they are the foundation not only to a value-based international order, but to a stable and secure international order. Mm. Um, nearing the end, I, I would like to come back to what you said about your idealism and, and about actually the necessity to always ask yourself, uh, what are you going to do about the world uh, as you think it should be? Um, what does this time require you to be, is how you ask it in your book. Well, what would be the answer to that question for yourself personally? In what role do you see yourself most effective in the coming years? You know, I, I know it sounds like a, this actually does sound like a politician's answer, you know, uh, uh, to say I haven't thought about that or, or I you know, don't believe like you. that. But, I, I know it's the ultimate uh, dodge, at least in this country. I don't know if people do the same thing there, but um, but I, you know, it really this 
election is so existential. I mean, it's existential for the planet, right? Just the, you know, this is this is the weather, the extreme weather events we have with this level of warming, and and Paris, you know, will we already know that Paris would not prevent, you know, four degrees of warming or three and a half degrees of warming, uh, you know. That is our focus is on the what Obama used to call the fierce urgency of now. <laughs> and so, you know, if Biden, I think for any of us, if there's any task that if he wins and there's any task that he feels any of us can perform that would be useful to helping us dig out of this whole uh, restore American leadership, you know, not for its own sake, not just to like nobody wants to lead for the sake of leading like it's to lead because there are a set of problems that are coming crashing down on our shared future. And, and so, but, but again, I can barely, you know, I just, just, I, I'm not sleep. None of us are sleeping, (laughs) you know, it's, it's around the clock sprint uh, to not leave any stone uh, unturned because we all have regrets about the last time about believing the polls believing that Republicans who know better will, you know, ultimately serve as a guardrail or a constraint. All those guardrails are gone. If Donald Trump gets a second term, we don't have inspector generals in our agencies that are that are there holding anybody to account. All the four star generals he assembled at the beginning, they couldn't take it anymore. Uh, they've left, um, you know, the the signal to you in Europe and, and audiences all around the world which will, it would be taken as an affirmation of lying and of xenophobia and of racism and bigotry. And we, we, we just, we just can't have that happen. And so, so the focus is, is just 24 seven on winning the election. And then, you know, we'll see what happens after, but really, I swear, I, I, all I was thinking about was how the hell am I going to do this interview from a car? <laughs> that was my, that was my, my main thought today, not about, uh, you know, any kind of professional, uh, future, but but you know those questions will come if they come. That role you played very well, at least uh, from the car. Thank you very much for for this talk. I would like to suggest uh, to go to switch to our moderator who has been following up on the questions coming in in the chat. So please, Lotfi, tell us what is the question that the audience wants to pose. Uh, one question has been popping a lot is what do you think the world and male world leaders can learn from Jacinda Arden? And what do you think of her approach? Is female leadership the answer to right-wing politics of divide and conquer? That's such a great question. And, and you know, congrats to Jacinda Ardern for what looks to have been a, an overwhelming victory here. Um, uh, really an affirmation of the leadership style that she has brought. Um, I think what she's brought is, you know, what, it, it, it used to be necessarily something that we would put on a bumper sticker, but uh, in light of some of the leadership that you see, you know, from Boris Johnson or Donald Trump or, uh, you know, Alexander Lukashenko or whoever uh, uh, is sort of denying science, you know, this respect for science, this respect for expertise, but beyond the rigor of her uh, response, I think the, the empathy that she has shown, you know, in dark times, you need humor. She's held press conferences for children dedicated to speaking directly to children in terms that they understand, including about, you know, lockdown and why you can't play your sports in the way that you used to play them and and why school is going to be different, you know, for short periods of time. Of course, they've because she's handled she and her government and the society as a whole have handled the pandemic so well, they've actually had to have far fewer, um, you know, incursions on life as they used to know it. But, you know, I just, I just think that human touch, the empathy, meeting people where they are. You know, so many politicians these days just, you know, they, they, they're mailing it in. You know, they're, they, they're, they're not sufficiently sensitive to who it is they're actually talking to. And I think she just retains that kind of down-to-earth understanding of, of, of different communities and really tailors her message and, and tries to meet people where they are. Now, if I could add just one thing, because you asked the question also, or, or people have asked the question about female leadership, you know, I, 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 it is striking how many female leaders have excelled uh, in, in handling the pandemic. It's equally striking how many male leaders have, have bungled it. Um, 
but perhaps there are so many more male leaders, maybe maybe the, the, the ratio isn't as bad as it can feel because it's the prominent male leaders who've done the worst. Um, but I, I did want to say that I think one does have to ask oneself what it takes around the world for a woman to become a head of state in 2020 or 2019 uh, when many of these, uh, or, you know, 2015, when some of these leaders were coming uh, up, or Angela Merkel, who's been around for much longer. I mean, these women are not, you know, these are kick-ass women. These are women who um, often were busting through glass ceilings, you know, throughout their entire careers, and not taking no for an answer, and finding the right touch uh, and the right balance between expertise, um, you know, and empathy and, and, a, and a show of decency. I mean, they, to get where they got, these were women who had developed a really adaptive set of leadership skills. And I think those skills have been on display. But the other thing to say is just think of what it means for kids in the countries that are governed by women, whether in Taiwan or Germany or Iceland or New Zealand. Um, for those kids... You know, this for many countries is like the Battle of Britain. You know, it's a really traumatic national experience. And for kids to see that the, the, the people who are pulling their countries through, you know, assembling their cabinets, making really tough choices about how to balance the economic toll of the pandemic while, while still, of course, you know, prioritizing the health of their citizens. Uh, this is going to change how young girls and boys see their own futures and and see what's normal and see what what good crisis management looks like so it's actually quite thrilling to think of the cascading uh legacy of of the effective leadership that's been shown by by people like jacinda ardern all right thank you another question is popping up would you ever consider to run for president of the united states I'm from Ireland originally, and so I'm an immigrant to this country. There and you go. a crazy quirk is that uh, you you have to be born in the United States uh, to become president of the United States. So, uh, no, I've I and I I mean I I cite that as if it's merely a technicality that would would deter me. But I the the <laughs> thought really hasn't entered my mind, except in so far as really nice people ask me the question, and so. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, but I've thought about, you know, would running for office be a way, a good way to serve, you know, or is it better to, to stay in, in the realm that I've been in, which is to, to be in a policymaking role, a kind of public policy role. And, and for now, you know, definitely serving as a diplomat and, and, um, you know, drawing on what is my area of expertise, which is, which for my career and, and even wearing all these different hats is human rights and, and foreign policy does feel in an age where expertise is not being as valued as it as it should be and as it once was i think it's good to at least for now for me to to stick with what i what i know best and one final fast question you speak of constraints of governments what constraints should the public be more empathetic of or aware of you know i i hate to kind of end on this note because it's um it's a bit my my answer i suppose is a little bit banal or or kind of simple but I think just, uh, I, I mean, again, this is the honest to God truth. Like what I what I have become much more sympathetic to is bandwidth constraints. But that's so boring, right? <laughs> but bandwidth, you know, it's just like in our own lives, you know, I mean, even take me today. I was just, how am I going to do this and get him there and, you know, finish the article that's due and prepare to teach my class for Monday. I mean, that's just as a citizen, mm -hmm. as a leader, you know, watching President Obama you know, uh, respond to the various crises that the Arab Spring presented while trying to get his health care bill across the finish line, while trying to build public support for uh, climate science and, and to try to, you know, uh, address the climate denialism that exists in the U.S., while trying to support Democratic candidates whose success he needed in order to get his agenda through, while trying to dig America out of the greatest recession then since the Second World War, since the Great Depression, um, you know, it, it, I was I would be working on a discrete set of issues and would just always realize that the, the, the sort of field of vision that somebody who is leading a country or even a, a, a foreign minister who's dealing with all foreign crises or a domestic policy 
minister or a chief of staff, just the range of issues, all of which present, if they make it to a head of state level, they wouldn't get there if they were easy, right? The easy issues are dealt with at lower levels uh, of government. And so I think just to, to recall that not everything can be done at once. I mean, this will be a cautionary tale also for progressives if Biden is elected, is to remember that you have a store of political capital uh, and you will deploy it and you will deploy it as best you can, given that you have to deal with COVID, the economic crisis, climate change. Biden has presented a vision that allows him to, to, to blend all of those together in this build back better strategy. But getting that across the, the finish line with uh, particularly skeptical Republicans uh, still having great influence in our society is going to be very, very challenging. And so that that range uh, of challenges that leaders have to face at any one time. And it's and the last thing I'll say, maybe to end on a positive note, is one of the things that I'm very heartened by is that the silos that have existed in public policy in the United States and in many countries for so long between foreign policy on the one hand, domestic policy on the other, I think finally those are being broken down. On climate, you can't avoid it because it's you have to do make your, your cuts to emissions nationally and domestically to be in a position to lead globally. Uh, the COVID, clearly, uh, the fact that we are we're, that Donald Trump had shunned global cooperation really put us, I think, at, at a at a further disadvantage in our domestic response. So too, our bungling of the domestic response and the fact that we're leading the world in COVID deaths makes it very hard to to lead on global health uh, anytime soon. And so these things are very, very related, but across the board, corruption, uh, we have a lot of cleanup to do domestically in terms of our democracy and corruption, but so too, I think that should be a centerpiece of Joe Biden's international agenda as it's what's causing people to protest in countries all around the world, this disillusionment with government and, and whether those governments are looking out for their people. So, so I think breaking down the silos between domestic and foreign doesn't help you with that prioritization challenge I mentioned, uh, but perhaps citizens and advocates, not that they should ever let up, but just to be aware uh, in the 21st century or in 2020 and 2021, just what any national leader is facing uh, the, the, and, and the linkages among them, but also the challenge of tackling all of them at once is, is very real. I would say thank you, Ambassador Samantha Power, for being with us from your car. Um, drive safely and um, good luck on your journey, wherever it will lead you. Thank you very much for being with us. Again, I was not driving, so, so my multitasking has some, has some boundaries, at least. Thank you all. I, I hope to be there in person one day. It seems like a great, great festival. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha Power. Thank you for joining us at Brainwash Digital. Uh, if you missed a part uh, of the stream or want to watch it again, the replay will be available on this platform in a few minutes. Uh, we also would like to hear your thoughts on the event. If you have any, some feedback for us, let us know by clicking the button below. And tomorrow you can see more of our Brainwash Digital events, the interviews with Gia Tolentino, Michael Sandel and Marta Nussbaum. Happy to see you tomorrow. Have a nice evening.